Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Project GD Chronicles with today's video and following with a series of short videos. As this cover image says, we will start to uh, very roughly look at what are the instructions that today are called undocumented, but at the time were called what they were. The illegal instructions, that is, Yom within the 6502 processors of the Commodore and 6510. The programmers, therefore, uh, the engineers had also thought of other types of instructions, although undocumented, but uh, of uh, general use or specialized use, uh, which could be useful for various purposes, if not also to optimize different, clearly, operations. Then, in fact, they were never made official, also because some of these strange opcodes uh, could then cause what are instabilities of the microprocessor itself. And then, but yeah, as we will see, they have limited functionality on 6502 and 6510, but not on other types of machines. Now let's move on to a brief history of where they came from and a bit about how they were discovered. And let's say uh, we will then start to introduce some commands uh, to expand on them in the following videos. Before starting, of course, a brief introductory discussion on what the opcodes are very quickly and what the addressing modes are, which we will then revisit in the subsequent videos, let's say uh, illegal or undocumented opcodes, and that not all these opcodes have certain addressing modes, as we will see them. Beyond this, let's say, uh, why are these opcodes considered illegal? Well, first of all, even at the time there was a decent awareness uh, of the existence of these opcodes, and as I pointed out to you, it was one of the machine instructions that still needed to be tested. And most likely they would have then been included in the processor or otherwise removed from what was the engineering process. However, it, what happened? Uh, there was the issue of what was piracy at the time, and it was particularly felt in uh, terms of copy protection. So being able to insert an illegal but functioning instruction, especially in what was a uh, machine language program, was essentially one of the possible ways or protections that effectively prevented copying because if we then disassemble the program and find an opcode that we don't recognize it can easily be interpreted in different ways now at the time it was clear these that uh, which are now called undocumented opcodes uh, they were given the name of what were considered illegal opcodes precisely for this reason because few knew them and were familiar with them and it was so to speak, a kind of black magic precisely around the knowledge of the few who were aware of the existence of these opcodes. A substantial amount of work was done by Wolfgang Lorenz. And as we can see in the Enmos 6510 unintended opcode, where? As you can see, then the work was continued. We have the addition still in the years of 2017. It is a fairly comprehensive paper that essentially describes all these commands and illustrates their characteristics, addressing modes, and possible uses. Obviously, how are these instructions clearly discovered? As you can see clearly uh, from engineering, they are uh, nonetheless discovered through reverse engineering and also uh, by the way individual codes are constructed. For example, we can see the break at this point zero, but likely might this level branch. Versus has a hexadecimal code, better. Maybe we take this one, which is the four uh, that loads a byte into the Y register in zero page. This number by itself tells us little or to nothing. It might suggest that the, uh, but likely could perform a load. But then we see that even eight and nine, essentially we are already in the stores. However, the opcodes are engineered in a certain way. And this also refers to what modern machine languages are. Let's give a more complete example of the instruction of what the LDA is, which practically what loads for us, an 8-bit value from what is a 16-bit absolute address that has $3010. And this particular type of instruction in the mnemonic code all of machine language is identified with AD. But then, however, what does it mean exactly? This We need to translate what is in binary code, and it could. Uh, and it also depends on the type of instruction, how it is implemented. And then we will also see an example in what is uh, the Inti machine language of our days likely. But here I don't have the table right now. These little numbers could indicate the type of addressing, these other numbers, therefore. 
uh, larger ones uh, could indicate the type of opcode, so from 1 to 8, from 1 to 8. And again, these could indicate further information regarding the opcode, such as read, write, read, write, meaning the direction in which the data is moved, or perhaps even the use of the XY register. So, essentially by playing with these numbers, it is possible in a certain way to also go and check if, for example, there can be other types of instructions. As you can see here, there are many types of addressing that could then be encoded. As I was telling you in these three, even though there are eight here, and so we see many more here. Addressing, however, it is also true that not all opcodes in particular can address. They can take advantage of what is a whole series of addressing modes, but they are very limited. Those that have the most possible addressing modes are the load, the store, and that's it, because then also the IDEX behaves in a relatively different manner. By the way, on my wiki, yes, I had. I was working on what was an AMS JIT 6502, and so it was a translation of what was the 3264 encoding into 6502. Then the project that I abandoned, but I had started, let's say, to to write these uh, programs were, well, here. It is identified whether the operating system is 32 or 64-bit because a $66, $66 is placed. And then here we have the various types of suffixes that are added. So you can also play around with it this way. So in the various addresses, if there is, for example, the use of a base, here we have additional types of opcodes that are taken from a gay table. And you see that as I choose here, the type of immediate opcode um, direction status here. It will select from another table all the various possible combinations. So, moat, register, read, memory, until we reach. What is the generation of the final code? Have you seen this type of instruction? Now, we won't go here into the technical part because here we can take into consideration. Also then the XM11 register is encoded in assembler with multiple instructions. That's all here because here we have the immediate, as you can see, because here it is little endian, and then here we also have the encoding where the operand is placed. This is essentially the division I mentioned earlier of these bits uh, uh, in a more extended manner. However, obviously we need to get back to us because in this video, the focus is on illegal instructions and not so much on the encoding of a single machine language instruction. And we will still refer to this very brief table where it goes. Well, A stands for accumulator, the two registers X and Y, the stack pointer, the program counter, and possibly the status flags. We will also refer to other types of addressing, such as immediate and effective DREX, and let's say magic chip, and in temperature-dependent constant value, because magic chip temperature is included, because clearly, as I was telling you before, this value can essentially vary in relation to what the temperature is and a particular number of the chip or the same implementation. So... In fact, it may not turn out that varies from machine to machine. Obviously, this part is very complex and would require an engineering discussion by an engineer to explain it in more detail. However, we don't stop just with this brief line of code. We will also look at the flags, but essentially for those who already program and are familiar with. The 6502 assembly, 502, 6, 510 anyway, are, and 6510 anyway, are already learned. And then finally, we will arrive and we arrive at what is a whole series of code tables, so to speak, illegal unintended operations of which we can then examine some and why not. Maybe at the end of these short videos, if there is interest, we could also try on the Commodore 64. See if they actually work. If it doesn't crash or anything else, as you can see here, there are already some operations like SHI, SHX, ANA, SHE, which are undocumented. Continuing our discussion, we we can see that in reality, these types of opcodes, sign are actually a combination of what are more opcodes. General, for example, we find what it lacks, where practically it loads the register, loads, yes, an immediate value into what is the A register, but it transfers it directly into what is the X register. And also, subsequently, in this case, R does nothing more than perform an AND with the immediate value and follows it with what is a right a right rotation as you can see from what these codes are being able to save one or mm. two machine cycles at the time was still a significant achievement remarkable obviously as i mentioned before it's not certain that these opcodes will work 
Oh, maybe on the emulator? Yes, but uh, on the physical machine, no, no, they certainly don't have all of them yet. All the common addressing modes for load, store, or what we are accustomed to. In the 6502, 6510A are still available, perhaps for one processor target, and not others. Obviously, here we are going to look at the first instruction. Maybe if we manage, we'll see another one, and then gradually we'll go through them in um sequence. The first instruction I was talking about is load, accumulator, and register X. So it is the combination of two instructions where the A register is loaded and transferred to the X register. As you can see, the mnemonic codes are A7, B7, and A3, B3, AF, BF. As I was saying regarding the construction of the opcodes, not all of them are documented here. Here we have three cycles, so we still have a saving and only these possible addressing types in these types of hot code. Clearly, not all addressing methods are available. Now let's see if it works directly on the vice, uh, because we will also disassemble it. So I had already started it on the vice. And as you can see, in location 255, I put 123, and in the usual location 4952, I put what is the opcode, as you can see, 167, and correctly. The vice is identified as lax, because now these versions of the vice probably succeed in what the Commodore 64 assemblers did from our times. They do not succeed. And it does nothing else but load this value present in location 255, which is 1 and 23. And then it directly puts it into the X register. But we will also verify if it actually does this with the memory locations. Here we have nothing left to do. Nothing left to do. Here, do nothing. Here we have nothing left to do but SIS 49152. It actually does it correctly. Print, pick. Of course, we will have to do what is the 7 and 81. Because in the, we have what is the register XMO. In it, we have the A register. Now I redo everything to see if it also modified the uh, register when I go to verify it for my direct knowledge. So here we erase everything, obviously. We put what is the register. A is already present here. We run it. We do print 780, and indeed it is as I thought loads the same value into the A register and loads the same value into the X register. E. So indeed they are load A and load X. So indeed this instruction does not load the value directly into X as could be done, but directly loads the value into the two registers. What is its utility? This is the explanation of why this type of instruction is performed. You can see that here. Uh, first of all, uh, it loads what is a a value from location 1000 added to what is the value I but it loads it into the two registers it loads it both into a and X then it performs an exclusive or and from a point of view of implicit indirect addressing it saves it in what is location FD this is because a is destroyed but not X at this point with a subsequent opcode then it clearly and independently from the program will save the register registers now modified in that specific jump location when it can be convenient for us both that lacks when we need to um, load the same value into two registers but not reload the same value subsequently twice in order to uh, so to speak repeat the same operation and indeed here we have what is an additional example which with the simple sax in this case is the store it practically solves all the previous problems with cycle saving but clearly it's clear that in this case since a we are here it gets destroyed but it is not destroyed practically in xx which then gets modified it is retransferred modified and saved in what is the fb song at this point we will end the video here because we will definitely return to it later this is clearly another use of the instruction but we have seen it previously and it combines what the instructions are storage A and storage X in the two registers at the same time. Another peculiarity um, that I wanted to return to later 
because we've already put too much on our plate, you see. The storage used previously is the exact equivalent of these instructions. Practically, it not only saves what is in register A, but it also saves the status flag, so they are not modified. The flags undergo operations and are stored. In this case, the values are processed and an end is performed with the value in dollar fee. And then uh, the original value of A is retrieved along with the status flag. This simple instruction executes uh, uh, many uh, uh, other uh, instructions. We'll stop here in this video because the discussion here already becomes already more complex and steep. As you may have seen here, we will cover them just at an introductory level. We might see them in action later on in what is a real machine. If you support it, if it doesn't crash, if you're interested, comment, and we'll see how to direct these short videos on the illegal opcodes of the Commodore 64. And thank you all. Thank you all for staying with me up to this point, Claudio.